Hello and welcome to Chapter 1, Key Issue 3, where we look at why are different places similar. So to do this, we look at scale. We could be looking at locally or all the way across the Earth globally. Scale is the relationship between a portion of the Earth and the Earth as a whole. When we do this, we're basically zooming in or zooming out. We're taking a look at various scales to analyze data in certain ways. One of the things we find is when we examine scale, if we're zoomed all the way out, we get into the term of globalization, which is the process that involves the entire world and results in making something worldwide in scope. When we examine scale, even if we zoom into a local, local scale, a lot of the times we're seeing aspects that are similar to different places across the globe. And this is where we really start to see globalization. For example, you look down here and we're seeing McDonald's, which is a um, development from the United States, but now we're seeing it in China and Dubai. We see it all across the globe. This is globalization. Globalization occurs in the economy where you've got finance and business intertwined because people are doing transactions across the globe. Maybe they're physically uh, have a business in the United States, but they're still selling things in Europe or it's being created in Asia. They're putting parts together in South Africa. You know, it's, it's a global economy these days. Those corporations are not just based in the United States, but they, are, they now have their operations transnationally, meaning in multiple countries. What this actually is, is a division of labor. At one time, a company in the United States would exist solely in our country. They would manufacture all of their parts and put the object together, maybe if it was a car. But nowadays, labor is divided through multiple countries. And then when we look at the global economy, we had the housing bubble of 2008. This is really a key moment because what we had is housing prices that were very high. They were inflated, meaning they were higher than what their true value was. And the banks were lending out money to uh, people that really couldn't afford to pay their loans. And things started to go bad. People started to, to default on their loans. And it didn't just affect people in the United States. It affected people globally because money is so tied together these days. This is where we start to see that we're not just individuals in the United States. We are tied to the larger, larger global community. So that was economy, but also we've got the globalization of culture, where we see increasingly uniform landscapes. Uniform meaning everything looks the same. Landscape meaning area where we are. So it's getting difficult to tell if we're in Dallas, Texas, or Chicago, or China, or Dubai, because we look down the street and there's a McDonald's, there's a Starbucks, there's a Walmart, and it all starts to look the same. And really, the only thing that might be different, so where we can get an idea of where we are, is the physical landscape, like mountains or rivers. So globalization of culture is becoming more and more prevalent or more common. We've got these fast food chains, gas stations, retail chains, religions. More and more, we're starting to see religions that are very similar, and we certainly have a, tr a, a very diverse tradition of religions across the earth, but there's religions that become more common as culture spreads because that religion is integrated in that culture. And then English, it's becoming one of the most commonly used languages because business is done in English. Scale is also considered in the distribution of features. We talk about space, and we're not talking about outer space. We're talking about an area that we're looking at. Space is the physical gap between two objects. Distribution. This is the arrangement of a feature in a space. How is it distributed? Geographers use spatial thinking to look at the arrangement of people and activities in a certain space and ask why they are distributed in that manner. Density is the frequency that something occurs. Concentration is the extent or the spread. And then, of course, we've got the pattern of how that occurs. The pattern is the geometric arrangement of objects. You think about pattern, many cities are, desi are designed by a grid pattern where they're like, okay, we want this road and it's going to cross section this road and it's all going to be neat and organized. The problem with that is it's a nice pattern, but you have stoplights that lock everybody up all the time. And in fact, the U.S. Land Ordinance of 1785 actually did divide the country into townships, little blocks that were six miles by six miles and a grid of the entire country. 
when we apply some of these terms that help us look at the distribution of features, it starts to make more sense. So we look at baseball teams in the United States back in the 1950s. And you had them all distributed up here in the northeast part of the country. Why was that? Well, that's because that's where the majority of the population was. So the, this area was very dense, very thick with baseball teams. But as we move towards the new millennium, 2013, we see that the baseball teams are spread out all over the country. Um, they have been distributed across the country. They are less dense now. Now they're kind of dense in California and still in, in the Northeast, but their concentration is definitely spread out. What is our cultural identity in a space? Well, the distribution across the space, how is religion, language, ethnicity spread in an area? For example, why do boys play baseball and girls maybe go to ballet within a certain cultural group? How do we define ourselves? What is our cultural? How is that distributed across the space? We also look, about, look at how it moves across the space. Our traditional roles and relationships influence how people move within a space. So, for example, if we look by gender, traditionally, not so much these days in this country, but traditionally, you see the males or the husbands that are going to work and coming back again. That's movement across the space. Traditionally, you would have seen maybe the female, the wife, stay home and take care of the kids and shuttle them to maybe soccer practice or things like that. How has that changed now? Well, now we know it's much more equal. Females are going to work and you see males staying home to take care of the kids and, or maybe both are going to work and they're using a service to drop the kids off at like daycare and they're shuttling them to practices. So our culture is, is changing over time through movement and through our distribution. We also look at ethnicity. Examine our city, Dallas, Texas. We look at ethnicities. Which neighborhood have mainly ethnicities of, of one color? Like, do we, can we go to certain parts of a city and find certain ethnicities? These days, that's still true. We can find certain ethnicities in certain areas of the city because, in general, people like to stay with people of similar background. But there's also many more factors that go into it, which we'll get into. Contemporary culture, identity. Contemporary meaning these days. So right now, it's important to consider multiple perspectives regarding space to examine distinctive spatial patterns by aspects such as gender, race, ethnicity, and religion. What does that even mean? Well, let's dig in with some examples. Because if we're contemporary, we're up to date, we're in current time, and we want to look at gender, race, ethnicity, and religion. We want to identify aspects, pieces of data from our culture that might help us to understand um, why things are the way they are, why people live where they do, and how they connect. Well, if we look at the data for same-sex couples, we can see where they live. And then we start to ask questions, well, why are same-sex couples highest in these regions right here? That's a question we try to answer as geographers. And then we look at a global scale for the entire Earth, and we look at the data on is gay marriage accepted? You can see the regions in green where it is accepted, and you can see where it is not. Why maybe is gay marriage not accepted in Northern Africa? Why maybe is it accepted in South America? These are questions we ask. One of the most important things we examine is the connection between places. Connection, obviously, relationships among people and objects, across the barrier of space. How do things that are in two different locations connect? The first thing we look at is the hearth, the place for which an innovation originates. What is the hearth of baseball? What is the hearth of a disease? We look at where it begins, and then we see how it diffuses, process by which it moves or spreads across the globe or an area, where it originated and how it diffused. There's two different kinds of diffusion we're looking at here. The first is relocation diffusion, which is the spread by physical movement of people from one place to another, meaning they take a trait or characteristic, they physically move from one place to another, and they have it now in the new area where they are. First example of this is when the English language was diffused 
from Europe to North America. You had people that were moving during colonization. They relocated from Europe to North America, and they diffused the English language. The second example of that is the euro. The coins that they used in Europe, they originated from individual countries that minted their own coins. So, for example, if you had a French euro, you'd have something um, that was representative of France on that coin, and it would diffuse because people would take their coin and they would travel, they would move to a new country within um, Europe. So they started to see that these coins would relocate because people were taking them there. The other kind of diffusion is called expansion diffusion, which is the spread in an additive process, meaning as it moves, more people access that expansion. It expands like ex exponentially. It gets a lot bigger, whereas relocation doesn't necessarily get bigger. It's just people moving. And there's three forms of expansion diffusion. First, there's hierarchical diffusion, which is a spread at certain levels. You think of it as a certain hierarchy. Like the easiest way is to think, okay, there's a hierarchy, hierarchy like kings, and they're in charge. So if they're going to spread information, it's going to go um, in a certain pattern. Examples we look at is soccer because it spread through certain soccer clubs that had the time to um, do this recreational sport. And we'll talk more about this later too. And the other is rap music because it started in urban areas and it spread from urban area to urban area to urban area because it was a certain demographic of people that were listening to this rap music. It was a certain level of people. The next is contagious diffusion. It's rapid widespread throughout an entire population. Contagious diffusion takes on everybody because it doesn't care what your hierarchy is. It doesn't care if you're a king or if you're like a poor farm worker. If you get sick, if you get the flu, it doesn't matter what your hierarchy is. Like everybody is in trouble. Everybody can get it. So it, flu is an example of contagious diffusion. Examples on ideas on the internet. This is contagious diffusion because whoever has the internet, they've got access to it. It spreads rapidly. Everybody can see it. Everybody can have access. The third is stimulus diffusion, which is the spread of an underlying principle. Meaning, you have an original idea, and part of that spreads, even though it could be a totally different medium. Examples would be like features of the iPhone. You know, whenever iPhone and Apple comes out with a new idea, they'll, let's say it's like being able to touch your screen, which back in the day, you know, we just had to press buttons on our phone. So when the iPhone came out with being able to use your finger to touch any feature on your screen, that was huge. So it wasn't necessarily the iPhone that spread across the globe, although it did. But what stimulus diffusion was about it is that um, other companies, other brands of phones being able started to use people touching the screen of their phone with their finger. So that idea spread through stimulus diffusion. Same thing with the Big Mac. You know, the Big Mac, it's a big American meaty, cheesy hamburger. Well, McDonald's spread into India, but the Big Mac did not spread to India. The original idea didn't spread to India. Why? Because they don't eat meat in India for the most part, okay? They've got like the veggie burger there in India. So the original idea, the Big Mac didn't spread, but through stimulus diffusion, McDonald's did spread to India. Relocation diffusion. So you look at the euro coins. So this is the number of people, the number of purses carrying euro coins in February 2002. Not very many, okay? But as we move across the years, we see that because people are moving, people are, are visiting, and they're transplanting their coins, we can see that there's so many euro coins now in Paris, in France. This is occurring because of relocation diffusion. Hierarchical diffusion. We look at the hierarchy of the Ford Motor Company. Let's say the executive chairman here, he's the man in charge, he has a memo that he needs to get out. How does it spread to his company? By certain levels, by hierarchy. He passes his memo on saying, we're going to sell only red cars now. So he passes that message on to the president and CEO. It goes by hierarchy or levels. And then it spreads out to people below him. Then it spreads out to hundreds of people below them, and then thousands of people below them. It moves by hierarchy. Contagious diffusion. It doesn't matter. You're going to get it. This is text, me text messaging. 
you see how text messaging, text messaging spread through contagious diffusion. You can see how everybody in Texas is text messaging. When it originated here in Oklahoma, everybody starts getting it. All right. But also, what's fun is to think about it is like a scary contagious virus. Like, okay, the virus, it initiated here in Texas, and then it spread contagiously all throughout the region. Everyone's in trouble of getting it. This is tech, text messaging through a one-month sample in each of these states. We also look at the spatial interaction, how things are able to connect and work with each other in spite of the space between them. One of the things that we see is distance decay, where we've got contact diminishing with increasing distance. So if I'm hanging out with my buddy Jordan and we live next to each other, it's easy for us to communicate. We just walk next door and we talk. But if he moves to Egypt, that distance decay, because he's a long way from me, perhaps, and this is sad, we don't really communicate as much anymore because he's in Egypt and that's a long way for me to get. So our spatial interaction is the block, the blockade that keeps us from interacting. But the thing we see happening now because of technology is space-time compression or the reduction in time for something to reach another place. And this can happen in a number of different ways. Now we've got our phones. Now we've got Skype. Now we've got FaceTime where I can just call Jordan in Egypt and talk to him on the phone. He's, it's like he's almost right there. Or I can get on a plane and be there in a number of hours instead of maybe days or weeks or a month. This network, this chain of communication is what connects people and places. But we still, on our Earth, have uneven development. We've got an increasing gap in economic conditions between regions. A lot of what we see is in developed countries or more developed countries like the United States, we see a lot of the resources and technology and development and infrastructure being placed there. And there's numerous reasons for this that we're going to get into. Well, same thing with Europe. So we have lots of technologies. So when I want to talk with Jordan, I can because... I've got the technology. He had it from the United States, and he went to maybe you know uh, Egypt, and we're able to communicate because development for us was very high. But if we're someone that's born or growing up in sub-Saharan Africa, we are not as developed. We are most likely not going to have the cell phones. We're not going to be able to buy plane tickets, so our distance decay remains. And in fact, you see on this chart here, the GNI of um, development between countries you look at just the monetary value. Developed countries have so much more buying power, so much more ability to travel and communicate, as opposed to developing countries. So here's the world average. It's not even close to what developed countries like the United States have. Developing countries, they still have got a long way to go. Our advantage is huge. Their disadvantage is difficult to overcome. And of course, we still have an income gap within our own country. We look at the wealth just in the United States. So here's the top 1% of income earners. You can see that you know, in 1980, it was kind of close. The people who earned the most money in this country, like the executives and the financial owners, they're you know, close to us, but then it's just started to get ridiculous. Nowadays, those who earn money at the top 1% have so much more money than the rest of us, this income gap is just like from the previous slide between countries, it's huge. It is almost insurmountable. Like how is someone who's an average middle class citizen, a teacher like me, how am I ever going to be able to keep up with someone who's in this top 1%? It's not possible. And then the problem is, look at here's middle class people like me and then here's the poorest. We're so close nowadays. The issue is income distribution has not spread equally. We see this globally, and when we zoom in by scale, we see this within our own country. 